I'm Nick Schifrin. Over the next hour, we'll present a PBS NewsHour series called Inside Putin's Russia. With the help of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, producer Zach Fannin and I traveled to more than a dozen cities, conducted 40 interviews, and were arrested twice. We'll report on Russian propaganda, Russia's opposition, Russians who join ISIS, and the tense relationship with the U.S. Our first story explores a new Russian identity. It's a combination of religion, old Russian traditions, and rediscovered patriotism. This new identity helps explain a lot about how today's Russia thinks, how President Putin acts, and why he remains popular. We begin our series in the southern city of Krasnodar. It is Sunday morning in Russia's conservative south. More than 70% of Russians are Orthodox Christian, and under President Vladimir Putin, the church has been revitalized. Archpriest Ivan Garmash is known as Father John. He tells parishioners there's only one way to be a true Christian, and he says being a true Christian is the only way to be a true Russian. The state and my faith are united. They can't be separated. The values of the church and the state coincide. In Russia, faith is patriotic. The Orthodox Church criticizes liberal Western values as heresies, while Orthodox priests bless Russian weapons and endorse Putin politically and personally. The president's faith increases his popularity. He is a religious man, and he takes part in the divine worship with the people in churches. What the president is doing, what the government is doing, of course we support it, because he acts conscientiously and truthfully. Today's re-energized Orthodox Church helps create pride in a shared religion. And historic Russian symbols like Cossacks help create pride in shared traditions. 500 years ago, Cossacks became the Russian Tsar's henchmen. They were famous and feared and helped police the Russian Empire's borders. The Soviets persecuted them. Today's Russia restores them. Cossacks fill Krasnodar streets at an annual parade. They believe Russia should be governed by tradition, not the rule of law. Only the nation that has kept its traditions and honors them more than the law deserves respect. The strength of a nation is in its traditions. For 17 years, Vladimir Gromov led the regional Cossack army. He revitalized this event and helped get the Cossack state sponsorship. President Putin awarded him the Order of Friendship Medal. Gromov considers Putin the custodian of Russian pride and stability, preventing the chaos of the 1990s. If it wasn't for President Putin, Russia as a state would be struggling through the toughest times now and possibly may have ceased to exist. Only Putin has saved the state from total collapse. And in return, Cossacks do what they feel saves Putin. During the 2014 Olympics, the band Pussy Riot performed a song that disparages Putin. Cossacks unleash their centuries-old tradition of vigilante violence. And in Kaliningrad, when a small group of demonstrators demanded the government change its foreign policy, a Cossack beat up 63-year-old protester Yevgeny Grishin. He lost 80% of his eyesight. If the regime can't suppress civil protests through legal means, they punish the people through affiliated associations, like the Cossacks. The regime acts through them. Why have the authorities crack down so much? In Russia, statehood comes first, and human rights come last. They use any means to prove the state is the most important, more important than a human. The idea that the state is more important than the people is actually not new. Russians have long had a collective identity. For us, the man is collective concept. We consider ourselves to be the part of the whole. So to be Russian means to share the same, the same cultural and historical identity. For years, TV fixture and firebrand Alexander Dugin inspired the Kremlin's ideology. He says Russia's collective identity comes from patriotism, projection of power, and respect for the ruler. Putin taps into all three, connecting today's Russia to its imperial grandeur. Patriotism is organic, it is not artificial. Empire or state is not something additional or artificial. Because it is our breath, our skin, our organic way of life. 
Today's Kremlin uses that patriotism to try and unite the population and convince them only a powerful state can protect them from enemies. Enemy number one, the U.S. America is on the brink of a revolution. Dugan and the Kremlin accused the U.S. of humiliating Russia by expanding NATO to Russia's borders and supporting revolutions in former Soviet states and satellites. Dugan advocates fighting back by attacking the West with asymmetric war. You talk about introducing geopolitical disorder, actively supporting dissident movements, extremism, racist, sectarian groups. This seems much more than just uh, exactly as you do. It's exactly what you do. You are supporting separatist group, you are supporting any kind of uh, nationalism, including Russian nationalism that is against Putin. My and words are the mirror of what you are doing. It is mirror and you are right so much because you are doing the same thing against us. <laughs> In Ukraine, that philosophy was weaponized. In eastern Ukraine, Russia aids local separatists who fight against the Ukrainian government that's pro-Western. And in 2014 in Crimea, Russia helped install separatist leaders who rushed through a referendum that led to Crimea's annexation. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. The day of annexation, Putin gave a speech combining religion, patriotism, and imperial history. He said the West had been subjugating Russia, and Russia was finally demanding respect. If you compress the spring all the way to its limit, it will snap back hard. Russia is an independent, active participant in international affairs. Like other countries, it has its own national interests that need to be taken into account and respected. It is impossible to overstate how transformative eastern Ukraine and here, Crimea, have been in recent Russian memory. After the Crimea annexation, Putin's popularity spiked to nearly 90 percent. Russians told pollsters that suddenly they felt like a superpower again. And Russians all over the country mobilized. That's Denis Solomon in 2014, fighting in eastern Ukraine. He's a former soldier who was working a mid-management retail job when he quit and crossed the border. Now, we hear that behind us. There's an intense battle. Mortars and shells are raining in our direction. Solomon went to war because of that collective Russian identity. He believed the Ukrainian government was attacking ethnic Russians. Those people who were under fire, I identified them as Russian people who needed protection by those who can at least hold a weapon. What was it about them that you felt, I need to help them? Those are the people with the same culture as mine, the same language, the same worldview. He was convinced of that by propaganda. In May 2014, dozens of pro-Russian separatists died in Odessa, Ukraine. It probably became the pivotal moment. There was a lot of information about how people were simply getting beaten and killed. Russian media exaggerated the attack, even using an actress to play a victim. We know she was an actress because she appeared in unrelated pro-Russian stories as three entirely different people. That disinformation campaign convinces the Kremlin's critics the new Russian identity is manufactured, a product of deception and repression. Sometimes that repression shows up in masks, guns, and camouflage. Those are special forces surrounding 66-year-old Ilmi Umarov in the jacket and jeans. Umarov is a leader of the Tatars, a Muslim minority in Crimea. He and other Tatars fight the Russian annexation. In response, many Tatars have been jailed on questionable charges, and Umarov was thrown into a local insane asylum. So this all together we call one big act of intimidation. The purpose is to silence some and keep others ignorant, turn them into zombies so they think the same thing. These are the necessary conditions in order for the people to be loyal to their government. But do you acknowledge that that is the majority of the population who feels that way? Of course, of course. We can't say that this is a stupid population or stupid people. They're just living in a constellation of fear, and the propaganda machine rolls over them like a steamroller. Umarov may accuse Putin of manipulating the population, but under Putin, Russia has revitalized the majority religion, brought back historic traditions, and projects power. So until there is an alternative, he's considered the creator and will remain the caretaker of the new Russian identity.
For years, the Kremlin and the media it controls have waged a multifaceted information and disinformation campaign inside Russia and pointed externally at its perceived adversaries. And last year, that effort crescendoed here during the U.S. presidential campaign. So our second story is about the information war. In Russia, whoever controls the media controls the country. And Saturday nights are Sergei Brilyov's. The 44-year-old is an anchor for Russia One. It's the country's most popular channel, and it's state-owned. Do you think that that means that you have a Russian perspective when you report? Well, of course there is a Russian perspective. There is a uh, perspective of your country in any reporting. Brilyov says he doesn't feel pressure to push the government's line. During the show we saw, he challenged a government minister about police jailing a former theater director who's a government critic. I imagine that uh, tomorrow, tonight, after the broadcast, I may have uh, in some security agencies and saying, what, he, what, what does he think he's saying? Russian state media have long delivered the government perspective and rallied the public behind it. Brilyov denies that's his job, but he hints at whose job it is. The Sandy program, which is uh, quite conservative in Western terms, ultra-conservative, I would say. Aggressive, perhaps? Uh, Fox News style. Sunday night anchor Dmitry Kislyov is part Sean Hannity, part Stephen Colbert. He's crass and entertaining and widely believed to reflect the Kremlin's thinking. The American press is driving Trump into a bullfight with no rules. The aim is impeachment. No pretext? It will be created, invented, engineered, exaggerated. CIA staff hackers are hiding behind another name, for example, behind the so-called Russian hackers. Kislyov started targeting Russia's opponents in 2012, after massive protests threatened President Vladimir Putin, says journalist and author Mikhail Zigger. That was very important to start hating the enemies. Uh, that's the, um, the point when the audience starts believing you. Russia is the only country in the world that is realistically capable of turning the United States into radioactive ash. Until 2015, Zigger was the anchor and editor-in-chief of TV Rain. In a sea of state media, TV Rain was an independent TV island. We had a reputation of the only TV channel that is trying to make real investigations. In 2014, TV Rain accused the Kremlin's chief political strategist of corruption. That was a very short but very effective campaign against us. I was getting like hundreds of uh, uh, personal messages with people wishing me that. Then all the major networks had uh, direct phone calls from Kremlin uh, and they had to switch us off. Within one month, their audience dropped from 20 million to 60,000. Protesters fought to keep them on the air. But targeting critical media is nothing new. In the last six years, the Kremlin's targeted 12 critical newsrooms. Zigar says state TV tries to convince Russians to support their government by replacing reality with a carefully crafted message. Democracy does not exist. Our system is much more stable because we, we have much more much stronger leadership. Putin is universally accepted as one of the most qualified heads of state on the planet, if not the most qualified. But this isn't only about shaping Russian opinion. Kislyov considers the news a weapon aimed at Russia's enemies, as he put it in an interview on his own channel. If you can persuade a person, you don't need to kill him. Let's think about what's better, to kill or to persuade. Because if you weren't able to persuade, then you'll have to kill. If the politics of defending your country's interest is pro-Russian, then probably we are pro-Russian. Margarita Simignon is the editor-in-chief of RT, formerly known as Russia Today. She says the network reaches 35 million viewers a day in six languages, including American and international channels. It's state-owned and aimed at foreign audiences as an alternative to channels Simignon calls pro-Western, CNN and BBC. If you look at any station, you will see that what people are reporting comes from what they believe in, where they stand, their background, what their countries believe in. And let us be one of the voices in that choir. American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations. Because when the choir sings just one song, awful things happen, like the war in Iraq. 
critics say RT isn't just another media voice. It highlights conspiracy theories. The article basically accuses the U.S. of manufacturing this Ebola outbreak. It describes a Holocaust denier as a human rights activist. Russia is a threat to the U.S.'s hegemony. And a neo-Nazi is a German expert. Germany is a country which supports uh, violent Islamism. The criticism is, again, that you're trying to confuse rather than inform. Now, that's absolutely a lie. We're never trying to confuse. We're informing. If we do have people appearing on the air live that are later found out to be Holocaust deniers or anything like that, we immediately put them onto a list of people who are forbidden from the air. You are telling me that people in the West are seeing us as a threat. Believe me. Most of the people in Russia are seeing the West as a threat. For the West, the biggest threat in terms of information comes from that building. That is the headquarters of the FSB, successor to the KGB. During Soviet times, the KGB launched deliberate disinformation campaigns, like planting the idea that President Kennedy was killed by the CIA. Today, Western governments accuse the FSB of launching the same kinds of campaigns, except instead of offering communism as an ideological alternative, they're waging a kind of hybrid war against their enemies with a new kind of soldier, hackers. Over the last two years, the Russian military ran online recruiting ads where soldiers put down their guns to fight a cyber war. In a January report, U.S. intelligence agencies accused Russia of hacking Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton campaign emails and leaking them to WikiLeaks to fuel Russia's propaganda campaign. It was designed to, quote, undermine public faith in the U.S. democratic process, denigrate Secretary Clinton, and harm her electability and potential presidency. It worked. The Clinton campaign has now had to deal with more than a week of embarrassing daily revelations thanks to WikiLeaks. Now, these WikiLeaks release have rocked the campaign. WikiLeaks has released what appears to be transcripts of paid speeches by Hillary Clinton to Goldman Sachs. Hacked emails became anti-Clinton talking points, and many of those talking points were spread online by fake accounts known as trolls, believed to work in this St. Petersburg building. 42-year-old Marat Mindiara used to be one of those trolls. Suddenly you see the, a lot of comments at night and they're uh, all the same, yeah? And it's exactly the people are doing their job. Mm. They have the topic, they have a time to do it, they write it and you see it. Every day, Mindiarov would get a document that instructed him what to write. On Christmas Eve 2014, he was told to, quote, create a negative attitude about Obama's foreign policy. So he posted photos comparing Obama to Hitler, portraying the U.S. as a fish about to eat the planet and an eagle sharpening his talons. He posted under the headline, Can the U.S. Take Russia Out? on 50 websites in 23 cities. And fellow trolls Kirill Lavashkin, Gennady Orlov, Mike Brandon expressed the exact same thought. 600 posts from 70 fake accounts in 12 hours. Just one battalion in a sock puppet army manufactured by a handful of trolls. How many identities will the workers be expected to pretend to be? Hundreds, hundreds, really hundreds. I myself maybe have 20, 30, I didn't count them. U.S. intelligence says the likely troll financer is Evgeny Prishgozhin, a businessman with catering companies. He's been dubbed Putin's personal chef. Mindyarev left the factory because he didn't believe in its product, but he says it's effective because the stories are succinct and echoed widely. Everything is very simple there, yeah. Black and white, no color, just black and white. Russian propaganda is actually very predictable and relatively simple. And I think of it as the four Ds, which are dismiss, distort, distract, and dismay. Ben Nemo is an Atlantic Council senior fellow studying how Russian media, hacking, and trolling combine. You get your own people to write this, but then you pretend it's not your people, it's, it's just some do-gooders in Russian society. All the different parts of your machine then amplify it. And what you're doing is you're pushing out in a dozen different languages on all the different platforms, there are one story. And what that story is, what the Kremlin wants it to be. In January 2016, it was a fake story that a Russian-German teenager had been abducted and raped by Muslim migrants. Russian state TV apparatus repeatedly reporting false claims after the German police had come out and said there was no abduction and there was no rape. The fake story helped spark real protests against German Chancellor Angela Merkel, a frequent Putin critic. But even though it was fake, 
Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov used it to criticize one of Russia's top adversaries. The motivation behind the campaign as a whole was precisely to weaken Merkel by amplifying this, this very personalized story about crimes committed by, in inverted commas, Merkel's migrants. We investigate the stories misrepresented by the mainstream media. Last year, the Russian propaganda machine exploited a research psychologist who argued Google was manipulating its results to favor Clinton. So this is a gentleman called Dr. Robert Epstein. He came out with a paper which said that by altering the results of a search engine, you could potentially alter people's voting choices. And Google's support uh, for Clinton is, uh, is really uh, very strong. It was quickly debunked, but the different parts of the Russian propaganda machine echoed the story, from RT to state-owned website Sputnik to Russian trolls. This was a classic example in which the different parts of the machine were amplifying each other. What you then had was the claim being picked up by a number of largely conservative media in the U.S. It looks like Google is in the tank for Hillary. There's no question about it. And there you've divorced the story from the source. Well, you've laundered. You've literally laundered the source. And in that the sense, it, the, the, the source has been laundered. God bless the USA. Then candidate Trump said words to the effect of Google was rigging its results in favor of Clinton. Google's search engine was suppressing the bad news about Hillary Clinton. Now, we don't know where he got that from, but we know that the insertion point for that story was a Kremlin disinformation outlet. For any purveyor of propaganda, your dream is to have some high-value amplifier amplifying you, especially if you can contrive that in such a way that you are divorced from it. How about that? How about that? Next, we travel to Russia's southernmost border. The Republic of Dagestan is in the North Caucasus, a kind of bridge between Asia and Europe. Over the last two decades, Dagestanis have fought a brutal separatist insurgency against the Russian state, with violence spilling over from neighboring Chechnya, where Russia's fought two wars. Americans might know Dagestan because the Boston Marathon bombers were Dagestani immigrants. But now there's a new problem. By one estimate, as many as 5,000 Dagestanis are fighting for ISIS. We travel to Dagestan to try and understand why so many Dagestanis are fighting in Syria and Iraq. It is no accident that the youth are tempted to go to Syria, because today there is a revival of Islam. Kazim Nurmagomedov is 62 years old, and his son fought for ISIS. He was never tempted to go to Syria, but he and his wife Rashida understand why their son Murat was. The Islamic call I was talking about, the one in every Muslim soul, is hidden deep down. It's like a light in someone's heart. Nurmagomedov lives deep in the Caucasus Mountains, where nearly dried up rivers meander through thousand-foot-high cliffs. And beyond ancient rock formations, isolated dirt roads connect secluded villages. One of those villages is Karada. Official population is 4,000, but residents say it's half that size. This area is nearly 100% Muslim. Before Friday prayers, men greet each other in the small town center. There are few young people, in part because this village sent as many as two dozen to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the wars in Syria and Iraq. That's her. That's your daughter. Okay. Amina Kondakova is a Muslim convert. She shows me photos from a happier time. That's very cute. She says they grew up traditional and comfortable. And then two years ago, her daughter Miriam and her son Ali Ashkat told her they were going on vacation. Instead, they traveled with Miriam's husband to Mosul, Iraq, to join ISIS. They lied to me about going there. I was so disappointed. And then I became afraid about what could happen to them. She says this town is pious but wasn't religious enough for her daughter. Did she feel judged by people in this society? Yes, they gave her looks. They didn't like how she was dressing. They wanted her to dress like everyone else. She wanted to dress the way it's written for a Muslim woman to dress. Kondakova believes that judgment drove her daughter away. She reluctantly admits that in Mosul, her daughter is happy raising her first grandson. Mom, I feel like I was reborn here. I regret all those years I spent in Dagestan. Don't you want to come here too? I want to live with you. want you to see my boy growing up. Nurmagomedov gets to see his grandson. When his son Murat left for Syria, he abandoned a pregnant wife. 
Alexei is now three years old. They look at photos of Murat as a boy and a young Murat clowning around with his older brother, Shamil. When you look at these, does it make you wish that your sons could all be here with you together? I am a realist. I know there's no return. Life isn't a book where you can tear out the pages if you didn't like what you wrote and write new ones. The Dagestanis who fought for ISIS continue a decades-old legacy here of radicalism and militancy. There's been a local insurgency here in the capital Dagestan, Mahaj Kala, for years, targeting both local authorities and symbols of the national government. Their most prominent attacks targeted civilians in larger cities. In Moscow in 2010, militants allied with al-Qaeda blew up the subway. In 2013, in Volgograd, they blew up a bus station and then a commuter bus, as seen on Russian media. There was no social or physical protection. Every day there were bombings, terror attacks that cost people's lives. Habib Magomedov is a former police lieutenant colonel and member of Dagestan's anti-terrorism committee. He says conservative Islam combined with high rates of unemployment and poverty to radicalize. It's the living conditions, absence of possibilities, absence of social mobility, which creates waves of anger and distress. There has to be some sort of history that sets the person on a certain track where you only need to light a match for the fire to start. That match is often a brutal security crackdown. In January 2013, Russian special forces flooded into Dagestani villages. Locals say security services have practiced collective punishment against entire families, torture, even extrajudicial executions. Magomedov admits they went too far, but he tries to explain their motivation. If keeping people safe requires limiting rights and freedoms of certain individuals, it's probably worth it. My brother died in 1998 when someone threw a grenade in his house. You know, the freedom of one man ends where the freedom of another starts. Today, the violence has diminished, but it's still religious Muslims whose freedoms are most often restricted. This mosque practices an austere and aggressive form of Islam. It also rails against government policy, and that makes it a police target. After prayers, police set up a checkpoint. Officers must meet a monthly quota of arrests, leading to what many call indiscriminate detentions, including of journalists trying to tell the mosque's story. We were filming that scene from across the street, just standing on the sidewalk for only about 90 seconds when police came up and arrested us. Uh, they threw us into their car, they drove us to the precinct, they refused to tell us why they were arresting us. Why is he being arrested? And when we were in the station, we saw dozens of men who'd been in that mosque before also arrested. That is simply how police here act. 33-year-old Magomed Magomedov is the mosque's spokesman. As you saw yourself, they arrest people not because they're suspicious, but only because they came to a mosque. Do you think that the tactics that the police use can help radicalize young people here? Of course. This is the thing that provokes people, since literally everyone can be arrested, not on the basis of actual cause, but something totally subjective. Then, of course, that irritates. And that helped lead so many to ISIS. The group exploits the abuse. Russia. Russian language propaganda says Russia oppresses Muslims and presents Syria and Iraq as a pious paradise fit for families. And as ISIS recruited Dagestanis, Russian security services showed some the door, exporting extremism by facilitating their travel to Syria. It was the right thing to do. Since the moment these people left Dagestan for Syria, local terrorism dropped dramatically. If they had stayed, there would have been terror attacks. There would have been human casualties. Who helped you leave? Who facilitated your departure? One of those who was pushed is this 27-year-old Dagestani who now lives in Turkey. We agreed to hide his face and alter his voice. People who were on the federal wanted list could somehow get a passport and leave the country. Some security officers said to them, we'll either kill you or you can leave the country. The way I was helped was that every time I went to my local government office, I was taken by the police and interrogated. But when I went to get a passport, nobody stopped me. And after the Dagestanis left, Russia made sure they never came back. They simply said that if I come back, they'll do bad things to me, so I won't ever go back. Many Dagestanis who fought for ISIS have died in Syria, and they're celebrated by ISIS propaganda. But some managed to escape, often to the port city of Odessa, Ukraine. 
Former ISIS fighter Murat agreed to talk to us if we didn't show his face. The majority went to Syria with the notion of jihad, that Assad was repressing Muslims and we needed to help them. We've actually already met Murat. He's the son of Kazim Nurmagomedov. Kazim is often in Odessa to visit. We consider our family lucky. He is back, alive and healthy, and realized that where he ended up wasn't what he thought it was. When his son left for Syria, Kazim didn't sit back and let him die. He traveled to the outskirts of Aleppo and saw the destruction. He helped convince Murat he'd made a mistake. Murat finally left when he thought about his own son. I was thinking about him constantly, hoping that I could leave and see my child. I was always thinking about what a big mistake I made. Thank God I was able to leave there alive, because practically everyone I knew there, no one is left alive. They all died there. Murat will never return here to Dagestan. And that's what's inspired Kazim to speak on camera for the first time. There are thousands of ISIS fighters in Syria who want to leave. I feel it. Maybe my story will be a lesson. How to do it, what obstacles to expect. I feel some sort of responsibility to use my experience to help get others out. People like Kazim's neighbor, Amina. She fears her daughter is dead. She hasn't heard from her in four months. What would you say to a mother in America, who's listening to this story. <laughs> Don't let your children go anywhere. Look after them. Look after their every step. But don't let them leave you. Ever. But their children have left this place, and most will never return. Next, we look at the fate of some of the Kremlin's enemies. According to one study, in the last three years, 38 prominent Russians have been the victims of unsolved murders, or suspicious deaths. The high mortality rate has a long history, but critics say it's emblematic of how President Vladimir Putin runs today's Russia. In today's Russia, there are consequences to criticizing the state. Please tell protesters their rally isn't sanctioned. They're asking President Vladimir Putin not to run for re-election. This demonstration is sponsored by the opposition group Open Russia. In St. Petersburg and across the country, police arrested more than 100 protesters. It is democratic opposition activists who are being arrested and, and given lengthy prison sentences. It is members of the democratic opposition who are being forced into exile uh, or harassed or attacked or murdered. 35-year-old Vladimir Karamurza is Open Russia's vice chairman. He's an outspoken activist, demonstrating against Putin and organizing protests. We first sat down with him late last year. We believe in the rule of law. We believe in human rights. We believe that Russia should enjoy the same democratic institutions that the rest of Europe enjoys. To try and create those democratic institutions, he teamed up with the man he calls his mentor, Boris Nemtsov, a former deputy prime minister who became the country's leading dissident. The two traveled to Washington to highlight the mysterious death of Sergei Magnitsky, a lawyer who exposed corruption among senior officials. Nemtsov and Kara Mirza convinced the U.S. Congress to freeze the assets of Russians believed connected to Magnitsky's death. These people in the current Russian regime who rule like to keep you know, their money, their assets right. in the West. They want a vacation in the West. They send their kids to, to, to schools to the West. And, and this, you know, personal accountability may well be the only thing that will make them think twice. A little more than two years later, Nemtsov was assassinated a few hundred feet from the Kremlin's walls. His death was brazen and shocking. This is the spot where Boris Nemtsov was killed, and you can see the corner of the Kremlin right there, just a few hundred yards away, and you can see the memorial for him that's on this bridge. Today in Moscow, a court sentenced five people in Nemtsov's murder. Whether or not they were the masterminds, they permanently silenced Nemtsov's outspoken criticism. You know, you live in Kara Mirza believes someone used poison to silence him, too. I started uh, suddenly feeling really, really sick, and within the space of 15 to 20 minutes, I went from feeling completely normal, you know, like I am now, to having a really rapid heart rate, sweating, palpitation. I started vomiting, and then I just lost consciousness. Kidneys, I think, went first, and it was the the, the heart, the lungs, the stomach, uh, uh, the liver, everything. Everything just shut down. So I have no doubt that this was a deliberate uh, attempt uh, to murder based on my political activities and motivated by my activities in the Russian opposition. There are people working as opposition who are not targeted. What is the line that you apparently crossed? There's a clear line between just saying things that are against the regime, and it's a totally different thing to go after their own personal interest, after their pockets. The history of assassination goes back decades. In 1940, Leon Trotsky was killed with an ice axe. 
In 2006, crusading Russian journalist Anna Politkovskaya was murdered. And in 2014, Alexander Litvinenko, a former intelligence agent who accused Putin of ordering Politkovskaya's death, was killed by radioactive tea. Denis Voronenkov was a pro-Putin lawmaker who defected to Ukraine and became a Putin critic. In March, he was walking down the street in Kiev when a gunman shot him three times. His body bled out on the sidewalk in the middle of the day. Maria Maksakova is his widow. I was dreaming about my first spring in Kiev with Denise. Um, I was dreaming so desperately. First, I thought it's better not to be born at all when you lose something like that. Maksakova lives in Kiev, where she's raising their son. In Moscow, she and Voronenkov were both lawmakers allied with Putin, and they enjoyed the spoils that come from power. But he'd also been an investigator who uncovered corruption in the Russian intelligence agency, the FSB. Who do you think killed your husband? He had certain enemies, and these enemies are in the FSB. The anti-corruptional uh, schemes that he would uh, investigate from here, uh, that is loss of money and loss of uh, influence, loss of, of everything, of positions. And that is something that they would not let him do. Russia calls her claim a fabrication, but his death fits a pattern. A once loyal family member becomes an outspoken opponent and ends up dead. A mafia family, you can be born into it, you can be adopted into it, you can't leave it voluntarily. People who have tried to leave the Putin family voluntarily have not fared very well. Masha Gessen is a Russian journalist, author, and prolific anti-Putin activist. You've been dubbed by some an enemy of the state. Are you an enemy of the state? Well, I'm certainly an enemy of the, of the mafia state, absolutely, yeah. I'm not um, an enemy of the Russian state. Gessen was the first journalist blacklisted by Putin's Kremlin. She's also been targeted because she's a lesbian who's raising adopted children. That's my son, Vova. His birth was not known to me, a woman. We met when he was two years old. In 2013, she helped lead a video campaign criticizing an anti-gay propaganda law. It helped condone homophobia and attacks on gay Russians. And Gessen argues the law explains how Putin rules. The autocrat needs everybody out in the street with, you know, with flags aloft. The need that's primary is the need for mobilization. To have mobilization, you need to have enemies. You can have LGBT people as enemies today, and then you can have Americans tomorrow and keep the LGBT people in your back pocket and then pull them out when you need them again. And Gessen says above it all is a boss served by loyal lieutenants who don't need explicit instructions to launch attacks. The patriarch of the family will say to you, you know, do I always have to tell you what to do? Like, don't you know what the right thing to do is? Does the Kremlin kill its political enemies? 100% sure not. The Kremlin denied our interview request, but Sergei Markov, a member of Putin's party and Russia's National Strategic Council, reflects the Kremlin's defense, counterpunch, and embrace conspiracy theories, starting with the assassinated opposition leader Boris Nemtsov. Who organized his killing? I strongly believe that it's terrorist organization, SBU, Intelligence Service of Ukraine. Ukraine killed Boris Nemtsov. You, not Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is country, uh, you know, captured by terrorists. But terrorists who captured Ukraine, they killed Boris Nemtsov. But it's more than Nemtsov, right? Vladimir Karamurza has been poisoned twice. Anna Polskaya was, was killed. Uh, there, there are a lot of people who have criticized the Kremlin who end up dead. First of all, not too much. This atmosphere which is killing people exists. But this atmosphere has been created not by Vladimir Putin, but by Western countries against Russia. For the people Putin targets, that argument is an attempt to distract. Russia, surrounded by enemies, we should support even stronger than before our leader, etc., etc. This is standard propaganda for any authoritarian regime. Mikhail Kasyanov was Putin's first prime minister. In the early 2000s, the two worked together to pass much-needed economic reforms. In 2004, Putin fired him, and Kasyanov became an outspoken opposition politician, appearing alongside Boris Nemtsov and Vladimir Karamurza. Last year, a prominent Putin ally posted a video of him and Karamurza in crosshairs. But not all of the Kremlin's enemies end up dead. Some end up humiliated. How did they target you? On television, though, they're blackmailing me and uh, just creating dirty stories, etc., etc. Five months before 2015 elections, state television broadcast Kasyanov having sex with his assistant. The video helped fracture his party. They will try to destroy publicly, to destroy morally, and uh, rep uh, reputation of all of us, and they're doing this. 
quite successfully, and they, they, and they, they can, will continue doing this. And is there anything you can do to stop them? Uh, we cannot do anything because we have no protection. We have no free and fair elections. We have censorship in the media. We have political prisoners, more than 100 political prisoners now in Russia today. One year after he nearly died from poisoning, Karamurza got better and restarted his work. In February, he was a few hours away from boarding a plane to Washington, where his family lives for their safety, when he says he was poisoned a second time. We sat down with him and his wife, Yevgenia, in March. But I couldn't breathe. And at this stage, you know, when you're lying there, trying to gasp for air, um, you know, I think I felt just life slowly going out of the whole body. And I remember that distinct feeling that this is it. This is the end. Now I'm going to die. The only thing I, I was able to do, uh, I, I called my wife, Yevgenia, who was here in the United States. I asked them to take him to the hospital, to the same medical team that had treated him in 2015. Had he been on a plane, had he been alone in his apartment, uh, had he been somewhere with, I don't know, in the streets of Moscow, Oh my God, what are you doing to us? <laughs> um. Kara Mirza had noticed that almost every night, Moscow city workers remove Boris Nemtsov's memorial. So we made a film to protect his mentor's career and life. Boris Nemtsov, for new terminology. That film was the most difficult thing I ever did in my life. This film is about the portrait of, of a man who could, uh, if not for a quirk of fate, uh, very well become president of Russia. Do you miss him? There are no words to describe how much it is. Sorry. The risks, they do hit close to home, closer and closer every time. Have you ever asked him not to go back? It is terrifying. I'm not going to lie to you. But um, I want him to continue to do what he thinks is important what he thinks is right. And her faith allows Karamurza to keep his faith that he can change the system. He says after recovering, he'll go back to Russia to finish the work that he and Nemtsov started. Vladimir Putin is now serving an unprecedented third term as Russia's president, and he's expected to seek another six-year term in next year's presidential election. Putin's been widely popular, but this spring, for the first time in years, there were large anti-government demonstrations across the country. And finally, the U.S.-Russia relationship. To say it's been tense is an understatement. So next, we try and understand how Washington sees Russia and how Russia sees the United States. On Russia's most patriotic holiday, Russians of all ages remember what they consider their finest moment. They mark the anniversary of victory in World War II by honoring the dead. Kuriganov Naimovich's grandfather fought the Nazis. He says Russia and the U.S. were once allies and should be again. We really want to love you and be friends with you. We are waiting for you to finally meet us halfway. For Russians, it's the U.S. who's unwilling to come halfway. Many here believe President Trump wants to improve things, but is being blocked by what Dmitry Shoykin calls the American establishment. Trump wants to do something, but he's forced to follow the general political line. Donald Trump is the most right-wing candidate of the Republican Party. Perhaps nobody expressed more hope in Trump than Alexander Dugan, a right-wing TV firebrand and philosopher who's helped inspire the Kremlin's ideology. Really, we supported Trumpism. We supported uh, agenda. Dugan says the Kremlin saw Trump as a kindred spirit who vowed not to meddle internationally. We supported this choice of anti-establishment conservative American revolution. That changed when President Trump ordered a missile strike on Russia ally Syria and said he felt he must respond to a chemical weapons attack. As long as America stands for justice, then peace and harmony will, in the end, prevail. We trusted not in Trump as pro-Russian figure, we trusted in Trump realist, and we are disappointed. The disappointment and tensions have been growing. Last month over the Baltic Sea, a Russian jet flew within five feet of a U.S. Air Force reconnaissance plane. That same week, a NATO jet shadowed the Russian defense minister's plane, and a Russian jet came up and rocked its wings to demonstrate it was armed. 
Last year, the Obama administration accused Russia of hacking the election and then seized Russian properties and increased sanctions. All of that has led to Russian frustration. Maria Zakharova is the foreign ministry spokeswoman. We were trying to establish normal relationship. Normal. Do you know this word, normal relationship? What is wrong with this? President Putin and I have been discussing various things, and I think it's going very well. Last week, the U.S. took steps toward normalization. Presidents Trump and Putin announced a deal on Syria. Both presidents called their meeting the first step to warming the relationship. If we develop our relations in the same way, there is every reason to believe that we would be able to at least partially restore the level of interaction that we need. The president echoed that hope. On Sunday, he tweeted he wouldn't dwell on 2016 hacking and wrote, now is the time to move forward in working constructively with Russia. Foaming at the mouth. This is not the language other Trump administration officials use about Russia. On Syria. How many more children have to die before Russia cares? On Ukraine. We do call on Russia to exercise influence over the separatists in the region whom they do hold complete control over. And on Putin personally. This is a man for whom uh, veracity doesn't translate into English. The one senior administration official who's declined to echo that criticism is Donald Trump as candidate and president. Wouldn't it be a great thing if we could actually get along with Russia? Wouldn't that be a good thing? I respect Putin. He's a strong leader, I can tell you that. Unlike what we have, we have a pathetic leader. Putin's a killer. A lot of killers. We got a lot of killers. Why, you think our country's so innocent? And last week in Warsaw, President Trump once again questioned the U.S. intelligence community's unanimous assessment that Russia hacked the 2016 election. I think it was Russia, but I think it was probably other people and or countries, and I see nothing wrong with that statement. Uh, nobody really knows. At the very least, giving the president all the benefit of the doubt, this is very bizarre behavior. Democratic Senator Mark Warner is the vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee. We are seeking to determine if there is an actual fire, but there is clearly a lot of smoke. Warner's helping lead the Senate's investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election and whether President Trump or his campaign colluded with Russia's attempts to sway the election. We first interviewed him three weeks ago. It is very strange that any presidential candidate, and in particular a Republican presidential candidate, would parrot so much of the Russian line. Republican Senator James Lankford is also on the Intelligence Committee. In some ways, has President Trump aligned himself with the ideals expressed by Russia? Yeah, he's pushing out some messages that are consistent with the Kremlin policies. And I would tell you every opportunity that I have, I try to articulate very clearly. There's no question that the Russians were trying to hack into our election. There's no question that we should have a strong NATO and the United States should be a part of that NATO alliance. Do you believe that he's not echoing that because the Russians have compromising material on him? I don't know. I hope not. Um, but the goal of this investigation is to not only reconfirm Russian intervention and explain that to the American public, but to also see if there was any contacts between the Trump campaign and the Russians. And just this week, we learned that last June, Donald Trump Jr. met with lawyer Natalia Veselnitskaya and lobbyist Renet Akhmetshin, both believed to have ties to the Russian government. I spoke to Senator Warner again last night. This indication that they were willing to accept this information from Russians, and it was part of an overall Russian government effort to help Trump and to hurt Clinton, I think this is the first time the American public has seen that in black and white. Much of this town has been worried about Trump and Russia since he became president. Current administration officials tell NewsHour the White House drafted an executive order that would have lifted sanctions imposed on Russia over Ukraine. Senior administration officials and the intelligence community successfully lobbied against it. And this spring, senators passed a bill that would restrict the president's ability to lift those sanctions. The bill is not yet a law, but it was designed to be a nearly unanimous message to the president and to Putin. We believe strongly that what Russia continues to do to be able to threaten Ukraine, threaten its neighbors, threaten NATO, to continue to pry into not only our elections but other, other elections is destabilizing it and it demands a response. But they've yet to have a consequence for what they did in the election time, and they should. In some ways, the president has fallen in line. On Sunday, he tweeted he wouldn't lift sanctions on Russia over Ukraine until Ukrainian and Syrian problems are solved. And last week, he also endorsed Article 5, NATO's collective defense. The United States has demonstrated not merely with words, 
but with its actions that we stand firmly behind Article 5, the mutual defense commitment. That convinces many in Moscow that the U.S. establishment is making sure the U.S. remains anti-Russian. Dmitry Trenin is a former Soviet Army colonel who directs the Carnegie Center in Moscow. The United States has been, remains, and will be the power that defines a common Western, i.e. U.S.-driven, foreign defense and security policy. And given that, Trenin says the U.S. remains Russia's main adversary, and Russia is simply targeting the U.S. with whatever tool it can. And I'm sure that the Russians have been looking at things, have been hacking things, have been using the material that they have hacked. Why are you surprised that, sh that you are being hacked? This is a method of espionage. This is what you do. If you can do it, do it. If you can protect against that, protect against it. But don't whine. But it goes one step further. Many in Russia look at Washington's turbulence and see a U.S. they'd considered strong and unified suddenly weakened. And they're exploiting that weakness in the U.S. foundation. It is not so coherent. It is not so stable. It, and it is vulnerable, I would say. And we have seen that. We have seen what we needed to see, to see vulnerability of American society. And with that vulnerability, with that lack of unity, both American and Russian officials acknowledge that Russian interference in the United States is going to continue. For all of us at the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nick Schifrin. Thanks for watching.